So thank you so much for joining us. This is our uncorked video chat, which we do every month. We pick a topic every month um, and we highlight things that are going on in our industry. We may have a guest speaker sometimes just so that we can kind of get um, the uncomfortable questions answered that you don't feel comfortable asking your fellow event planners or whomever else. This is a time for you to feel free to let your hair down, for you to grab a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, whichever you so choose to drink, um, and join us and chat together and uh, we go over a couple points. So today we're going to talk about applying corporate tactics. So before we even get into the actual topic, I wanted to take a moment to see how everyone was doing in lieu of COVID, of course. Um, I want you to put a thumbs up in the chat or some sort of statement in the chat to let me know that you are doing well and that you are practicing social distancing. Um, I wasn't always practicing social distancing, we're going to be honest here, but I am now um, and I'm super at home, you know, which is very rare for me. So. I hope that all of you are well. I hope that your families are well. I hope that, you know, COVID isn't impacting you that hard. Um, if it is, you can leave your contact information towards the end. We'll be happy to reach out to you to be of some sort of resource to you. So good, April, Amber. Thank you so much. Um, next, we want to talk about where you are in corporate. So before I even get into the topics or the key points, I want to figure out who I'm talking to. And so I want to know um, where you all are in corporate. So I just posted a poll and if you all can answer it for me. And so it has, yes, I work in corporate full time. Yes, I work in corporate part time or from home, which most of us probably work from home now at this point, but just on a general basis outside of COVID, right? Do you typically work from home? Um, and then, no, I'm pursuing my business full time. Okay, so we have a 50-50 split, which is really good. That's going to help me uh, with the five points that I do have. So we have some of you that are working corporate full time and then some of you that are pursuing your business full time. So I want to be very clear. Oftentimes you see on social media where everyone is saying, hey, you should quit your corporate job. It's like slavery and blah, blah, blah. When we get done with this, you're going to know whether you are in the right space to quit your corporate job right now. Um, I think that it's very important that you assess everything before quitting your corporate job and that you don't just do it because the gram told you to do it. It's super irresponsible for someone to tell you to go ahead and quit your corporate job. And so I don't want to be that person. I want to be the person that makes sure that you are all set up and geared up before quitting your corporate job. So a little... A uh, snippet about me, um, I worked in corporate all the way until 2018. Now, I started my business uh, eight, nine years ago now. So I started my business nine years ago. I own IB Events, which is a wedding planning business, as well as I own the Planners Corner. So um, I started my business nine years ago. And yes, it took me pretty much six to seven years to say, hey, I'm no longer working in corporate, right? Now, I don't think that it'll take everyone that long. Um, I'm not going to say how long it will take you. Hi, Khadija. I'm not going to say how long it will take you. But what I am going to say is that I had to make sure that things were done correctly and that I learned everything that I needed to learn from my corporate job, which actually had to do with events, um, before I left corporate. So, we're going to go through five things that I pulled from my uh, corporate experience. I worked in hotels and venue sales. Um, I was a director of weddings and special events for a country club. Um, I worked a lot of corporate meetings for Hilton Hotels, and I did a ton of weddings. So I kind of was, I had the opportunity to already be within the event industry throughout my career to begin with. So for those of you who are in the event industry, put a thumbs up in the, even if you're working in corporate. So you're working in corporate and you are still a part of the event industry or your job is somewhat related to that. Put your thumbs up um, so that I know that you're doing that. If you are working, um, if you're working your business full time, then let me know if or how long you've been out of corporate. So 
Tell me how long you've been. I never started corporate. Okay. I worked for large companies for six years before that awesome April. Um, okay. So some of the things that I really wanted us to pay attention to in corporate that we typically complain about when we're in corporate are going to be listed in these things. So the first one was I learned the importance of contracts and legal terms, right? I learned how important it was. I had so many experiences where if we had not had a contract, we probably would have been out of business at this point. So there were so many people uh, that didn't read their contracts that just signed it and created room blocks considering that I worked at hotels um, or signed it and didn't even understand like what they were committing to, what a food and beverage minimum meant, what a, a food and beverage minimum meant, what an attrition clause meant, um, they just didn't really read over them. And so once I started noticing in corporate the amount of pushback that I would get from clients who needed to cancel something or do something different that went against the contract, I then realized that people really don't read their contracts. So when I started um, my business, it was really important for me to make sure that my clients were reading my contract. So I was trying to figure out what way can I get them to actually pay attention and to read the contract, right? I can't sit down and meet with every person. If I have brides that are not in this state, then I can't sit down with them. So easily enough, right? I went ahead and I did the phone consultations with them or in-person consultations with them, which were very slim. Um, and then after I uh, gave them the contract, they had to initial by certain spots. So I made sure that if it was a really important clause or something that I needed them to really get, like, listen, sis, you're not getting your money back, okay? I had to make sure they initialed by that clause, right? So they knew, hey, this is an important clause and you want to pay attention. Not that, you know, every clause in your contract isn't important, but some for some clients or for some uh, events stick out more than others, Right. So I made sure they initialed by the contract and I made sure we set up a meeting afterwards to go over their invoice and go over their contract. So if they had any questions about the contract, what it said, that was their prime time to ask those questions before committing to me, right? Um, and I made sure that they had the opportunity or that I had the opportunity to thoroughly explain to them what certain things meant. Because a lot of people didn't, don't understand what legal um what certain legal terms mean right they're not a lawyer they don't sign contracts every day they don't work in a field where contracts are like at the forefront right so it was super important for me to get my clients to understand you have to read this contract for the sake of you and me so I would say make sure that you have a system in place or some sort of process where you're holding them accountable to reading the contract, especially for people who are doing weddings. It's super important because typically they have more than one um, decision maker. So it could be the bride and the dad because the dad's paying for it, or it could be the bride and the groom, right? And you want to make sure that there's more than one person. So I often ask, hey, can I have this initial meeting with you and the groom or you and the bride just to make sure that we're all on the same page? So two things out of the first topic, which would be contracts and legal terms, is to make sure that you're finding a process to hold them accountable to reading the contract and that you're getting all of the decision makers involved and explaining to them what they're committing to if they sign your contract. The third thing, and honestly, it sounds like a lot of work probably is probably like, why I got to do all that? Like they should, they're adults, they should read their own contract. But the reality of the situation is, is that if you get them to do this in advance, you'll have less of a headache later. You'll have less conversations and less emails being sent. Like, please refer to your contract, right? The petty emails that we send. So you would have less of that if you just did this on the front end. The second thing uh, or the third thing that I want to mention in this uh, contract portion is making sure that you have some sort of legal backup or a legal team. So luckily, at most of the places that I worked at, we actually had a legal department um, and it sometimes was not in the same city. And then sometimes it was like literally next door to me. So 
we had some sort of legal team that we could have advised us and and how we were answering these questions or statements that our clients were giving us. Um, we had someone to help us figure it out or lead us along the way. So I use um, a, a legal business legal attorney. Her name is Cheers Dorsey. And so she's based here in Atlanta, Georgia. For those of you that are based here, um, if you are not, it's still okay. She still does services for people outside of Atlanta, Georgia. I'll be happy to put her information in the chat later. But it's super important that you get some sort of legal advisor or legal consultant or a business attorney that you can have and pick up the phone and say, hey, I just had a client that asked me this or COVID just popped up out of nowhere. Um, COVID just popped up and we are having trouble figuring out how we're going to address this. So I would make sure that your contracts and your legal terms are all put together. The second thing that I want to mention that I kind of pulled from corporate was a yearly calendar. So I worked at um, Embassy Suites Atlanta Buckhead and I had a sales director who every year she made us order like halfway through the year. So let's just say right now we're in 2019. So at the sixth month of 2019, I mean, we're at 2020. <laughs> I want to go back to 2019. Anyway, so at the sixth mark of um 2020, we would have to purchase a year calendar. And we would purchase a year calendar because she wanted us to start looking ahead of what was going on, right, Amber? <laughs> what was going on in the next year or what happened in this year that we need to make sure goes on in the next year. So it was super important to look at things um, from a large scale or a full spectrum and to really understand like, how this month can impact next month. And so along with the yearly calendar, it started to put things in perspective of how I sell and price my services in my small business. So I realized that with the yearly calendar, my director of sales will often say, hey, you know, in this month, this is a peak month. This is a month that you have a lot of business or that we are sold out completely every weekend or every day, honestly. And if that is the case, why are we charging the same as every other month? Or she would say something along the lines of, hey, this is a need month, i.e. January for most event planners or wedding planners, but this is a need month. And if we um, are stuck in this month, in what of, it's stuck in this month without any revenue, right? No events. We're barely uh, cutting even in our, um, in our finances or in our service fees, right? So she would say, what can you do in other months to make up for what you lost in January? So looking at a full year calendar and being able to really digest it and understand what each month means to you and how it affects your business was major for me. Once I started kind of getting down um, my yearly calendar and the things that I did last year and you know, hey, these are my blackout dates or it's my birthday weekend. And so if I'm going to work on that weekend, it's going to cost a lot more money. Right. So once I kind of started figuring out those things, it made me understand where I can charge more, where I can charge less or where I should be charging steady. Right. And so I encourage you all, if you all do not use a yearly calendar or if you don't have a yearly calendar um, and you don't have a system to how you're looking at your yearly calendar to number one, purchase a yearly calendar. You can get those from any office supply store, Walmart, anything like that. Or number two, you can go to our website. We just launched digital products where you can get an event planner yearly calendar on there um, and you can put your own dates to it. It's 2020, 2021, whatever you decide. Can I describe what I put in it? Yes, Amber. So basically I would highlight before I started booking and most of us are, are at this point starting to book for 2021 especially with COVID happening. We're booking for 2021 because everyone is rescheduling from this year. But in an ideal business, you would want to book halfway through the year for the next year anyway, if not almost at the beginning of the year. So in that yearly calendar, I would go ahead and highlight and I color coded it. Maybe it would be a pink highlight would mean this, a black line would mean this, a yellow highlight would mean blah, blah, blah. 
So I would color code it and I would put into the calendar, you know, what are my blackout dates? When am I not willing to work? When is a, a weekend that is always booked for the past couple of years? Or when is a weekend that most venues charge more? Or when have I felt stressed and tired in the years past? So those of you that are already out of corporate, you should kind of have some of that data. And we're going to get into that in our next points as well. But you should kind of have that that data from years past that can kind of help you build on this calendar. I would remind myself when tax season was on the calendar. I would remind myself um, how many, I put really super important things on that calendar that meant something to my business or the history of my business. Um, things that were personal to me, whether they are personal accomplishments or whatever that looks like. But I color coded the calendar so that when I went back to my clients um, or when people inquired for those dates, I could say, okay, this is what that month looks like for me. Or I need at least two events in this month. I need four events in this month to offset the last month. So every calendar is going to kind of look different. It just depends on the nature of your business. But I encourage you all to get a calendar for sure. Um, and to look at things in its totality and not just on a month by month basis. So number three, the third thing that I pulled from corporate was meetings, meetings, and more meetings. Some of my team is on this call. And so I know they're probably like, girl, listen, you the queen of emailing us about meetings. I love y'all. But I learned from corporate that over communication is how you're going to thrive in this business, right? I learned that you want to make sure that you have all types of meetings, whether that's a forecast meeting. We every um, every week we had a forecast meeting and I know that sounds crazy, but we did. So every week we had a forecast meeting and every week we had a BEO meeting um, and a forecast meeting is what we looked at for the next 90 days. Right. And so it helped prep our team to understand hey, this is what we're looking at over the next couple of months. This is what we need in-house. This is what we need to make sure that we have. These are the things that we need to make sure that we're covering, right? These are the things that we need to make sure we're financially budgeting for. Um, if we have a ton of events in this 90 days, we need to make sure that we have an event planner emergency kit set already or maybe multiple, right? Just in case So if we don't have time to go back out to the store. Um we need to go ahead and schedule out email blasts to our brides about notifications and blah, blah, blah. It was a way to jump ahead of the game so that when you're sitting in the month, you're not worried about what you need to be doing. You're really talking about two months from now. So we had a 90 day forecast meeting and then we also had a BEO meeting and a BEO meeting was really for the next 14 days. It wasn't a 90 day spread. It was a 14 day spread where we scrutinized detail by detail of every event. Who is the client? What do they want? What do they need? What are their some what are some of their pain points? What are some of their worries? What is their lifestyle like? All of those things should matter to your team. They should not have just the generic base information. So it shouldn't be, hey, we have this wedding, the Smith wedding. It's on the third of blah, blah, blah month. And, you know, just show up at eight o'clock. No, it should be, we have a Smith wedding. This is the picture of the bride and the groom. The bride and the groom like this, but they don't like this. These are some of their family traditions. It should be so detailed that it makes no sense, right? So you all should make sure that you're having a ton of meetings with your team. If you do not already have a team, I encourage you to build one. There are a lot of people out here who are seeking um, experience in the event planning industry um, who are who desire to further their career and learn all of the things that you already know. And so even if it's not someone that you hire on at a, at a salary paid position, I encourage you all to get a team that you can constantly build with. So I learned that in corporate. I pulled those same meeting styles. Me and my team try to meet every month, um, once a month right now. And literally, almost, most of us talk almost every other day. So Khadija, who's in here, <laughs> who's doing the sound check? Thanks, sis. Um, Khadija, who's in here, um, literally hears from me every other day. If she doesn't hear from me every other day, something's probably wrong. So at this point, and Tolu, Tolu hears from me a lot. So at this point, 
you have to make sure that if you're not going to have a ton of meetings that you are communicating across all borders or giving them a platform to communicate through. Hey, girl. So, um, yeah, absolutely, Khadija. There's something that we have to update each other about. Some Someone said something, an email, a this, a that. There's so many events going on that there's something we have to say or we need advice about, honestly. So I encourage you to build your team, over communicate with your team, set standards for your team, communicate with them in a way like no other, and also give them opportunity to uh, tell you where to improve or what you can do better or their communication styles. I encourage you all to have recap meetings with your team after every event where you're recapping what went on in the event? What do you need to change moving? Making sure that you can recap with them um, and figure out maybe where you all may have missed the mark in an event or something to celebrate an event where you did something really good or maybe your team saw something you didn't, right? Because you can't be in every place all the time. And that's the purpose of having a team. So it's important that you have a meeting to discuss what's going on over the next 90 days, right? What's going on in the next two week span or the next 30 days? And then what is going on um, after the event is over? What happened? What went on at the event? What did I miss? Um, and what are we going to do to improve or add something to our contract? Literally every event that me and my team recap or they call me and tell me something happened, I have to add something new to my contract. It's sad at this point. So I encourage you all to make sure that you are listening to your team that you are um, serving your team just as well as you are serving the client and that you are building a healthy team for sure. The fourth thing that I took from corporate was how history impacts the future of your business. So I, like I told you all, I worked at Hilton and at Hilton, we had this system called r &I, and I absolutely hated this system, hated everything about it when I was there. And in this system, it was nothing but numbers. Every time someone called us and said, hey, I want to have a family reunion. Um, I want to reserve 15 rooms for my family over this weekend. We would have to write down all the information, call them back, go into our RNI system, which stands for rates and inventory, by the way. So we would go into our RNI system and we would literally scrutinize three years of pricing. So that means, what did I charge last year, the year before that, and the year before that for a group block like this? What group blocks did I already have on the books? How much money did I make in those years? Did I miss out on any money in those years because I took other group blocks that didn't really fill up? Um, what did it look like for me in those years? And what do I need to change to make it look better this year? And it sets the standard, right? If three years ago you charged $8.95 for day of coordination services, then this year there should be no reason why you're charging any less than $8.95. So it should put a standard on your business, right? Understanding the history of your business and having a system in place that allows you to create that process or to look back on years right instead of manually when i first started in business i actually was manually um putting stuff into an excel sheet so that i could remember it and then i would realize that it's not enough space on the excel sheet and there's too many notes that i had and it just wasn't going to work out right who was going to go back and read that long excel sheet every year not me sis so what I did instead is I got HoneyBook. You all know I'm a huge advocate for HoneyBook. I absolutely love it. But really, I'm an advocate for any CRM system that can be of benefit to you, right? And so the CR CRM systems that are out now that helps events, um, whether that's 17 Hats, HoneyBook, um, and uh, systems like that will help you create history, right? Or to help you go back and look at history. Right now, I can go on my HoneyBook and look at last year, how many events I've done, what they look like, how much I made and how much I made profited and loss in um, 20, 2019 and by the month spectrum. And even if I wanted to condense it down to a week. So let's just say a bride called me and said, hey, I want my wedding on October 26th. I'm not even sure if that's a wedding weekend. But point is, I want it on October 26th. 
So on October 26, I can go back to last year's date and say, hey, this is how much I made that exact weekend. There should be no reason why I make any less than that this weekend. In fact, I should be making a little bit more. So it was super important for me to kind of get those structural tools down pat and to understand um, what it looks like in terms of business moving forward. So I also pulled in, in, in this impacting the future portion, I also pulled pre and post P&L statement. So a P&L statement, P&L stands for profit and loss, right? And so we, for every event, literally at the country club that I worked at, every wedding that came across my desk that we booked, we were required after they signed the contract to do a pre P&L statement. So it was a pre profit and loss statement. That means I want to understand what I'm looking at in terms of revenue before the event even gets here, before we actualize the numbers, right? I want to know, hey, we told them their food and beverage minimum is this. Hey, this is the guest count that they gave us. And so we may need this amount of servers or coordinators or whatever that looks like. Hey, we also realized that they need linen. And so we promised them linen. And so this is the cost to rent the linen. So we would literally write in an Excel format and I'm getting ready to upload a pre and post uh, statement mock form for you all as well on our digital products. But we would basically scrutinize that so that we can make sure this is a good fit for us. And where do, while we have the time in the beginning stages, where do we may need to upsell or increase in revenue in order to meet a goal? And are we losing out by booking this event on revenue or are we actually making a profit? And so we did that. Um, and then after the event was over, we did a post P&L statement. And in that, PN, that post P&L statement, what we did was we actually put in all the actual numbers. This is how much the guest count really was. This is how much they really spent in food and beverage. Um, because if it's a cash bar, or open bar or whatever, we don't know that yet, right? So this is how much the food and beverage cost us. This is how much the linen cost us. This is how much the charger plates may have cost us. Whatever you had to put out, we got to see the balance on the end. So, hey, you have two sheets now. One sheet tells you what you were expected to make based off of this event. Now, if the count went up or down, that could shift. But this is what you were expected to make when they first contracted. Then you have the post P&L that says, hey, this is what we actually made. And so moving forward, we need to, if we lost, right, we need to figure out how can we make sure we never lose again in this situation? Or if we profited, what did we do so great that made us this large margin of a profit? And let's keep doing that. So I encourage you all to uh, first purchase our post and pre PL statements, which will be up this week. And then if not, I encourage you all to create your own and to look into researching um having those things and and doing them when you contract someone and then when the actual event is over so it should be a re post event documents that you already have whether that's the PL statement the recap form with your team a recap with your bride or with your client just to kind of understand um what they thought were some rooms for improvement or what they thought was great right and so you want to make sure that you have all of those things in place so that you understand next year how to operate and how to move. And then the year after that and the year after that. Businesses are successful, especially major corporate companies are successful because they're paying an extreme amount of attention to what they're doing with their money, where it's going and where is it coming from? And where is it gonna come from next year again? Is this a client that is a residual client? So can I get that client again? Are they going to have a baby soon? Are they going to have another birthday? You know, what? A, keep abreast of what's going on with your client so that you know how to move and make those notes. So thumbs up if you're still here with me tracking and all of that important information was great. I have one more tip for you and a bonus and then we're going to get into why corporate, um, what you should know before leaving corporate. So the first thing, I mean, then the fifth one, so we did first contract in legal terms. Second, making sure you have some sort of yearly calendar that gives you a full spectrum. Three, forecast meetings um, and 
meetings and more meetings and more meetings and building a team. Four was making sure that you understand the history of your business and how it can impact your future. And then five now would be how to sell. So in corporate is where I learned uh, or where I got all of my selling skills from. It took me a little while because I was never a salesperson. I learned that it wasn't about what you were selling. It was about who you were selling that product to or that service to, right? And so once you started to learn who you were sitting in front of to sell, because a lot of hotel business, we they wanted to come and tour the place. So, but even if not, right, let's just say you're not sitting in front of them. Once you learn the correct amount of information about the client and the person that you're actually selling to or the person you want to sell to, right? That's the, that's the reason why everyone says, make sure you're understanding your audience. So once you learn those things, you can sell like a pro. It will be, you'll be able to do it in your sleep. So once I learned that I, my audience was women, right? On both the planner's corner and on IB events, but we'll go back to IB events. So on IB events, my audience was women and brides. And I realized what pulled at their heartstrings. This day was super important to them. I had to understand why it was super important to them. I also have to keep in mind, and Tolu would often remind us of this at events, that although we have done 20 plus weddings, 100 plus weddings, they've only done one typically, right? And so this is a big deal for them. Everything is exaggerated. Everything is super special. Everything is meaningful. And their heart is in this event. It's not just any ordinary event. And once I learned that, I realized that I needed to talk to them with love and compassion and care and care about the small details and the things that most people wouldn't care about, right? I had to show up in a in an arena or as a person that they normally wouldn't meet or that they need on their team because maybe their mom thinks they're being dramatic or their husband or fiance thinks they're overdoing it or spending too much money. You had to show up as the person, almost as the best friend, right? And so once I learned who I was selling to, so we all know that they need the service, right? We all know that they need an event planner or they need a wedding planner. The key is to figure out why they need it. Right. And so in corporate, what we would do is not only did we, you know, communicate in a way that we would figure out their exact needs, hence the purpose of a consultation or, you know, a contact form and, and so forth from there, you would get the basic needs. But you had to learn key questions or key, com key, yeah, we'll say questions, key questions that you had to ask in order to get a bunch of information so they don't feel questioned to death. So oftentimes I would ask a very vague question. Like, so tell me where you are in the event planning process. And they would give me a mouthful. Well, I started at this, I did this, I did that. This happened. Um, and then my mom, she thinks this. And then my aunt, she's really an event planner, but I don't want her. Like, you get all of the tea at that moment, right? Off of one question. So one is to figure out the key questions that will get you multiple answers without having to question them to death. The second thing would be to um, have a sales blitz week. So what that means, and this is probably more beneficial for someone who is in corporate planning, doing brand management, um, or someone who um, someone who's doing birthdays maybe or something of that sort this really isn't for someone who's doing weddings i mean we could try to apply it but it might not always work out so basically we did a sales blitz week and what that means is we would go out to local businesses who we know share the same type of client that we do right they're maybe providing a different service but they share the same client so for in a wedding spectrum just to try to apply it would be a bridal gown store and so we would go out and we would make those partnerships and sell to that bridal gown store, not just to the bride, right? Because once we leave an impact and an experience with them, they're going to refer us to every bride that walks in. The last thing we were talking about is Sales Blitz Week. So the Sales Blitz Week basically is where you go out and you create a, a partnership with someone 
who um, shares the same client as you do. So I'm a wedding planner. And so I want to go out to places that other wedding planners um, book services or do business at. So whether that's a bridal shop, a florist, or whatever that looks like. If I'm in um, brand management or if I'm in corporate, then I want to go out to companies that are like tech companies or that will book my services for me, right? And the purpose of having this week, right? They typically have a week once a quarter or once every six months. You get to choose, right, how often you want to do it. And they print branded materials, or they go and they have this, uh, for me, it would be creating some type of staple flower centerpiece that's huge or a flower wall in a bridal shop. So every time a bride comes in there and says yes to their dress, they're taking a picture in front of my floral centerpiece. Or as soon as they walk in, they're looking at it like, oh, my God, this is so beautiful. I would love to see this at my wedding. And that's immediately a way to sell without me even having to be there. So the key to selling is not only figuring out who you're selling to, um, communicating in a way that you can get more answers out of one question, but also creating time spans or marketing campaigns where you're going out and you are putting together something or some type of deal with someone that sells for you even when you are nowhere to be found. So... I had to learn that early on. Um, I Thankfully, I learned that before I quit my corporate job. Um, but that is kind of what kept me afloat. So a lot of people are like, yeah, I get a lot of my business off Instagram or I get a lot of my business through LinkedIn. And reality set in for me, although I get a lot of participation on Instagram and I have a lot of followers there on my IB events page, most of my actual booked, contracted, and signed business came from creating those partnerships and selling to another company that has the same uh, client that I do. So referrals go a long way. And I don't mean just family referrals, but I mean referrals and business partnerships and relationships that are in direct contact with your audience. They're not just out and about and they happen to overhear someone in the grocery store and need your services. Those are great too, but you want to partner with someone who has your direct audience. Does that make sense? The last thing is I learned that everything was a negotiation. So, and this is still in the sales realm. Um, I learned that everything was a negotiation. I learned that everyone wants to win out of this, right? And so although there is a service price, right, that's considered as the bargaining tool or the negotiation, it's more than the sales price, right? So if I book a client and I make a pretty decent amount of money off of them, but they aren't really a part of my brand or someone I would traditionally work with. Um, they've stretched my team. And so maybe some of my team quit or um, I can't use the photos because they're what they put out there or what they created wasn't up to standard from the brand that I want to keep up. So although I may have been able to pay bills, there's nothing else that I could do with this client or these things, right? Or these photos. So I had to learn and understand the art of negotiation. Not only do I need to get paid out of this for providing you the service, and not only do you want a good service, but there's something else that we want besides the payment and the services, right? The bride or the client may want more things. They may want a specific experience. They, I had a client that told me, we found the perfect venue for her. It was beautiful, had everything she needed, and it was in the perfect price range. And she walked out of that venue and she said, Brittany, I can't book there. And I'm like, I don't understand. Make it make sense. And so she explained to me that the energy that she got from the owner of the venue made it feel like she wasn't welcome there. And she didn't want any of her family to feel like that on the day of, of her event. So it meant that much to her that she was willing to go and spend money somewhere else or spend more money somewhere else for what she wanted. Right, April, it's sad, it's crazy. So I encourage you all to understand what exactly your client is looking for outside of the service and what you also need outside of the payment, right? Payment is great, pay your bills, sis, do what you gotta do, but you should also want a little bit more than the payment, okay? 
So the bonus one, before we mute out again at some point, I'm sure, the bonus one was office hours. It's extremely important that you set office hours. I complain so much in corporate about having office hours and being there at a specific time. I was like, I can't wait until I'm out on my own and I don't have to wake up at a certain time and I don't have to answer anybody email by a specific time if I don't feel like it. And here I am now in the morning at my desk <laughs> in an office by a specific hour because I want to be done with my day. And it created boundaries for me and the client, right? And so when I told them, these are my office hours, do not call me outside of this. I won't respond to any calls or texts or blah, blah, blah. Or you can send me an email and I will respond accordingly. Once I set those structured boundaries around when I was available to serve them, I felt like I had a balanced life again. Before that, when I first started corporate, I kind of just let people call me and do whatever they wanted to at any time. And I had no personal life. It was hard to juggle. It was hard to be a girlfriend. It was hard to want to cook at night. It was hard to do whatever else because I was trying to accommodate everyone's schedule but my own. So I encourage you all to make sure that you have strict office hours, strict boundaries around when you're available, why you're available, and what that looks like. If it's by appointment only, that's exactly what you mean. And make sure you're setting the tone. So that was the bonus one. I do want to cover two things that were a negative impact in my in my corporate career that I also brought over into my um, into my small business. So the first one was at one of my jobs. I was told that I was considered because I already started my business, so I was considered a conflict of interest because I was servicing uh, clients through my business. That the same place I worked at service the same style of clients, they considered me a conflict of interest. And so they literally told me, you have a choice to keep this job or and to stop running your business or to run your business and to lose your job. And I was devastated. I was devastated. I could not understand for the life of me why they felt like I was a conflict of interest. Now, the crazy part was is that I never really had um, we didn't share clients. Like I kept my business very separate, but I was very open with my boss about what my business was and how excited I was and, oh, I got an event this weekend and blah, blah, blah. But I kept my business very separate. When I did a site tour for that place, I did a site tour for that place. I didn't plug in my business. It wasn't any of that client's business. I just left it at that. I kept them very separate. However, they still feel like it was a conflict of interest. So, with that being said, this kind of this negative impact that it had on me, and I actually did leave that job, was it, it made me realize that the notation of we have to tear other people down in order to get to the top came from corporate, right? In my mind, in my in my theory, it came from corporate. And I couldn't understand why such a big company, a corporate company that has hotels in, a, in every city and state in the United States, right, um, would be so threatened by my small company that wasn't producing, in, in a year span, I wasn't producing what they were producing in a month. So at that time, I was super small. I didn't have a lot of clients. I didn't have a lot of revenue. And so I could not understand for the life of me. And so leaving that job made me realize, hey, you have to break that notion. Like you have to break that cycle that people really think that they can't succeed if there's someone else in their realm or in their arena or in their area that's doing the same thing as them. So hence why I started the Planet's Corner. Um, April says, great topic. I deliberately picked my last corporate job um, because I didn't need to sign a non-compete clause, it can be very difficult for us to navigate this. Absolutely. I've had a lot of uh, coordinators come to me and like, hey, I want to work with you. Can I shadow? Can I blah, blah, blah? And they would tell me that the last planner that they shadowed with or worked with made them sign a, a non-compete form or some sort of contract that said, you cannot do any business in this city or in this state for this amount of time or in my area or arena or if you're in Roswell. And it was just so crazy to me because I couldn't even, listen, I'm gonna get clients no matter who I help. Most of my coordinators actually, right, for six months, most of my coordinators actually have their own business. And I encourage that. 
do your thing. You need me to show up as a coordinator for you on that day and take off my IB events boss hat. I will absolutely do that. So it's about working together and making sure that we are creating a new normal for our industry for sure. So that was it for the tips there. I do want to discuss um, one last thing about leaving corporate. Amber says, so how would you feel? Actually, Amber, I'm going to answer your question after this. Um, give me one second. So um, these are a list of things that I thought of or that I would recommend um, leaving when you leave corporate, right? And not a list of tangible things, but if you're considering leaving your corporate job, these are the things that I would make sure that you understand and that you have. First thing first, and this is where I missed the mark, so I'm speaking from experience. First thing first is how to have passive income. If you have not figured out how you want to have passive income, and passive, those of you that may not understand, passive income means an income that doesn't really require you to do a lot of work. It's a one-time job thing, but you continuously keep making money off of it over and over and over again. You can make money off of this one thing for a year span, two year spans, however long you want. It could look like a digital book. It could look like a real book, right? A handheld book. You're only writing that book one time. And then you are making money off of it as time goes on. So, and I'm not saying everyone should go out and write a book. I think, I believe that you should write a book when you actually have something to say, right? Make sure that you're not um, saturating your audience with nothingness. So it's super important to make sure that when you take a microphone or you are given a platform or a stage that you have something with substance to say. So anyway, but neither here nor there. I would say make sure that you figure out a way how, or, or figure out a way to make passive income. Um, and if you want to talk about that more, we can talk about that later. You can schedule a business consultation or you can um, sign up for a webinar that we're going to do on it anyway. So there's that. The second thing is you should leave corporate when you feel like you've outgrown your welcome. I have a quote that I always say, if you feel underpaid, overworked, and underappreciated, you should leave. And maybe not leave for good to just start your own business, but you should leave and go to another business. You should leave, period. So if you feel those three, underpaid, overworked, and underappreciated, and really analyze what those things mean to you, what will actually make you feel appreciated? What will actually, what actually looks like, looks like the ideal job for you that doesn't feel like you're overworking yourself? So that would be my second thing. The third thing is, when you feel like you have met your cap and learned all you can at that place, not all you can ever, right? I don't think that we're all still learning, even me. But when you have felt, when you feel like you have met your cap at that place, move on. Do not sit in a place where you are not growing or learning anymore. I met so many people at my last corporate job who have been with the company for 15, 20 years, same position not a promotion, maybe some extra money, but the same position. And I was blown away. I encourage you all to make sure that you're either climbing the ladder or that you're learning some more or you're growing and, and you're learning from a director or a boss or even your coworkers, right? But you're learning something. And when you feel like you have met that, that cap, it's time to move on. Um, when you found your passion and you are committed to making it work, even when times get hard, there are so many days, Tolu knows, Khadija knows, there are so many days where I have wanted, especially my first year, where I wanted to throw in the towel. Take me back to corporate. I need health benefits. I'm over this. I don't want to do this no more. Count me out, right? And I had to realize that that's not how businesses become successful, right? You can't quit. You have to keep going and you got to figure it out and you got to create a system that figures it out. That's what you're doing as a small business owner. So 
if you have not found out what you're passionate about and what you actually want to do, how you want to help people or solve a solution, I mean, solve a problem, then you should stay in corporate until you figure that out. Um, if you are not committed to doing this and even when times get rough or, you know, there may be a month that you make tremendously less than you make in another month. October is a month where I make so much money and then I fall into November and December and I don't make a lot. So if you are, are not disciplined and ready to commit to that type of pressure and understanding that you have to look ahead and make real decisions, then you don't need to leave corporate. The last thing would be when you understand your audience, your niche, and that you will need a team or some sort of support system. You cannot do, entrepreneurship is not for the faint at heart. It is not for the weary, okay? So if you don't feel like you can find some sort of resource or support system or team or interns or the planner's corner, hey, plug. Um, if you don't feel like you can do those things, then you need to stay in corporate as well. And you need to make sure. And, you know, when I first went out in corporate, I didn't have a large team. I had a small team and there were some things that I felt it. I wasn't a perfect boss. I wasn't a perfect manager, um, but I learned and I grew and I understood what it actually means and what they actually need. Right. So I encourage you all to, to kind of take those things in. There were a lot of things that I failed at, but I just didn't give up. And so my encouraging piece to you to end this would be to not give up for sure. So I want you all to put any questions that you have in here. I am going to read the questions and go ahead and respond to them. And then I'm also going to put in um, the HoneyBook link if you all are interested in that, as well as the Pricing is Personal webinar that we're going to talk about actually creating a pricing structure that works for you. Um, and so you can sign up there as well. Um, so I want to talk about the question that Amber asked. How would you feel if they took a client? So I've actually had that situation happen. And for me, I, I don't know about you, but a lot of people say, no, you should keep business and personal separate, blah, blah, blah. Listen, sis. My business is personal. It's personal to me. All of this is personal. This is my real job all the time. I don't have nothing else. This is it. So everything that you do that attacks my business or that, you know, hits at my business is personal to me. So in terms of the person, which will remain unnamed, in terms of the person that uh, stole a client from me, I had to learn how to give things, I'm sorry, you guys. I had to learn how to give things in moderation. So I had to understand that, you know, maybe you're tr too trusting or you're giving them too much information and you need to slow down on how much information you're actually giving them. The other thing, the caveat to that is that you, what you can't do is withhold so much information from them that they can't even support you. So you have to make sure that you have an even balance there. Um, if that person took my client, they would no longer be a part of my team, period, point blank. You are allowed to have your own business as a coordinator under me. You are not stuck to my business for the rest of your life. I want to see you succeed and grow and do great things. Um, but we draw the line at cross-referencing, right? And the thing is that a person who would steal a client doesn't have their own best interest in heart because all of the clients that you have, and you can ask Tolu and Khadija in here, anything they need at any moment, Tolu can call me at 1 a.m., anything they need at any moment for their own clients, I'm willing to act as if they're my own clients. Hey, sis, I need a, a mock of a floor plan. I don't really understand how to do blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. I got this one. What you think about this? Like, it's a team effort. It, there is no... If I give you this floor plan module or this example or, you know, some suggestions on what you could do for your floor plan or a system you can hold your floor, floor plan in, it doesn't, I don't lose any money off of that. You know what I mean? So if you stole a client from me, you're missing out on so many other opportunities to help grow and build your business. You're missing out on the opportunity to say, hey, Brittany, you know, unfortunately, one of my coordinators or interns or 
temp agent people um, isn't showing up or they won't be able to make it anymore. Can you please come and help me? Like you're missing out on a partnership and an opportunity of a lifetime and not to toot my own horn because it would be the same vice versa, but that's just the reality of the situation. And that's how I look at it. So you have to be careful of who you add to your team and what their intentions are. When I do interviews now, I ask them, what are your goals? Like what, what are your plans? What do you want to do? You want to own your own business? You want to own a venue? What does that look like for you? So I would say that. Um, April said, I agree with you and I treat mine the same way. There's more, there's more than enough business for us all. Absolutely. April it is. Um, do they sign an NDA? Yes. So every person that comes on my team signs an NDA. Um, and it's just basically to say that you won't disclose any information from the client, um, their personal information, because for weddings, you know, on our team, you get a lot of personal information and that you also won't disclose any information before we do so what you can't do is disclose all of our invitations and everything we're working on on your social media prior to we us even putting it out on our social media so we're just very particular in that room can you hear me all right great any other questions that you want to put in it doesn't have to be pertaining to this per se but any questions that you want to put in that uh, you just want to know more about um, or if there's anything that you want to suggest as a next webinar or not a webinar, our, our next Uncourt chat, then please put that in now. I would love to kind of get your feedback um, and go from there. And I'll just wait a couple minutes in the question. You, you have questions. Event insurance, for sure. I think that could be helpful. Absolutely. I'll make a note, Amber. Okay. So if you all don't have any more questions, I truly appreciate you joining us. I hope to see you on our webinar on Thursday called Pricing is Personal, which we put uh, the, the thing in the chat. And then I hope to see you on our next month's call. We'll disclose that information via email. So if you aren't subscribed to our website, please make sure that you are now. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for your, okay, April, no problem. Feel free to ask it. Thank you so much for joining us and um, for being patient with <laughs> this microphone. I'm so sorry, you guys. Um, but April, yes, please go ahead and ask your question. I'll be more than happy to answer it. First of all, Khadijah, I just adore your post about being quarantine cute. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, wait, your hair. Oh, thank you. So I actually have not done my hair since like March because we were quarantined. So I had it in like wraps and not done, right? Okay. Um, and so now I am finally like dressed. This is the first time I put on makeup in 30 plus days. So thank you so much. I appreciate your kind comments, Amber and Khadija. Um, Clarissa, how hi, how do I get to the two worksheets you posted, please? So I posted um when you say worksheets, make sure that I'm correct. The first one was a poll, the second one was a honeybook. Honeybook was just for a link for you to get a free trial um and to see if you liked it as a CRM system. And then after that, we post it where you can sign up for the pricing is personal. Now, if you're actually looking for worksheets, um, yes, I can. If you're actually looking for worksheets, um, we do have some new digital documents that we just put up on our website under the shop column. So I'm going to put our website in here. And then you can um, go and look at them. We're going to kind of update them uh, shortly. We have a couple more that we're working on. It's about four more that are going to be put out. There's some helpful resource guides for you all. Um, and so hopefully those will be helpful for you. And then Amber said the link went away. Can you post again? So do you? which one do you need as for the link? Do you want the one for, I'm going to just post them. 
So that is the one for Honey Book. This is the one for Pricing is Personal. And the Pricing is Personal one allows you to uh, sign up for our webinar. So it's an hour long webinar where we're really going to be teaching you. It's going to be different than this style. It's not going to be where we, where you see me just kind of talking free flowing. It's actually going to be a, your learning and you're going to learn how to create price instructions and what to consider and why you should charge extra for this and, you know, where you can upsell. We're going to really dive into pricing in the event industry because I feel like often because we're not a government, um, we're not a government zoned in industry. It's very hard for us to all commonly stick to one price, right? Or a roundabout of a price. So I wanna kind of go through those things and make sure that we're all charging what we're worth and that you're getting the money that you deserve for sure. And now we all know that I need a new microphone. This is brand new. This is a brand new microphone, you guys. Look, brand new microphone. I don't even understand. Anyways, let's go to April's question. Um, so I just hit the year mark and because of non-competes and personal integrity, I'm unable to share the true caliber of work that I'm capable of. Since I'm still establishing myself as solo planner, it's been difficult to get clients with the budgets that I really want to work with. Other than style shoots, do you have any recommendations on how to get to the next level? So I have a couple questions for you. It does make sense. Now I got questions. Um, my first question is, you signed a non-compete form in terms of not being able to compute, compete with that company in a certain distance or distance and time frame. So that's my first question that I want you to type the answer. The second question is, um, what what style of client would you like when you say you're having a difficult time getting clients within the budget that you really wanna work with? So what style of client um, would you like to kind of sell to? And then the next thing was, you said other than style shoots, do you have any recommendations on how to get to the next level of clients? So for me, um, I think it's all about your consultation tactic. I think it's all about selling and creating partnerships outside of social media. A lot of people, and not even just in our industry, a lot of people get into entrepreneurship and think that their only way of advertising their services is to advertise them via social media. Yeah, Amber. So there's so many other ways that you can advertise your business, your portfolio to get a client. Most clients aren't even looking for a professional planner on social media. I actually use my social media almost as a portfolio. I don't even, if you look on it right now, if you go to Ivy Events on um, Instagram, I haven't even posted probably this year, I don't think, which is a bad idea. Don't do that. But what I'm saying to you is that the bulk of my clients, <laughs> the bulk of my clients came from those business partnerships that I created with other businesses, right? Um, and putting out reviews on my work, um, creating service packages and creating um, pricing structures that people would be interested in purchasing, right? Using creative hashtags, getting on directories, serving in committees. For a long time, I was a part of the National Association of Catering and Events, and I was on their education committee. And on their education committee, I got events from there, right? So there's so many, joining um, a city club or the gathering spot, joining places like that where there's other people, other people doing business who are seeing you out you are a walking brand, essentially, right? And so 
a lot of people think that Instagram and Facebook is just the mark and that's it. And I'm not saying that's you, but what I am saying is that you're going to have to get creative with your selling tactics as well as your, um, I guess you can say style shoots. You're going to have to get creative with those. Do a style shoot at home, right? Build up something, put some, a centerpiece together, a tablescape together, and do a style shoot at your house. A lot of people are like, I can't afford a style shoot. Do it at home with the stuff that you have. You'll be very um, shocked at how much stuff you already have at home from past events. And I you're more than welcome. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I really needed this girl time. Um, it was super great. Amber says, hey, April, I just saw you in D.C. I'm actually looking for a planner in D.C. for an event in October. Email me. Awesome. So this is what Uncorked is about. Like, this is what I would love to see happen all the time. I would love for a flux of event planners to get on one platform and talk about some of their struggles or their troubles and what we're dealing with and how we can be of help to one another. And that's what the Planners Corner is about. So I love you guys so much. I thank you all for what you do in our industry um, and how willing you are to gain resources and knowledge. And I can't wait to see you at next month's uh, Uncorked video chat. And until then, we'll chat later.